I'm John Batchelor with Professor Sean McMeekin. His new book is Stalin's War, A New History of World War II. Stalin setting the imperialist states against each other, tear each other up, and I'll gobble up territory. Except Stalin was out of equipment, weapons, food, in order to continue the fight. So he came to depend almost, uh, almost like a child on the arsenal of democracy. The arsenal of democracy run by FDR and the American people. However, we come to troubles, especially early 1942-43, in which FDR and Churchill make a deal, although it was Eisenhower who did it, with the French commander of the North African forces, a man who switches side, goes from being a fascist sympathizer to an American sympathizer. His name was Darlan. It's an obscure detail of history, but it did bother FDR, I learned from the professor, a lot. So we come to January 1943, the Casablanca Conference in North Africa. Stalin does not attend. Churchill's there. Roosevelt's there. Sean, why does FDR announce unconditional surrender? Well, it's a great question, John. And, and the Darlan deal and the kind of almost political stench surrounding it definitely had something to do with this, in part because Roosevelt was used to the kind of uh, the conservative Southern Democrats and the Republicans attacking him for various things from the quote unquote right. But he's getting it from the left now, too. They're all saying he's sort of soft, that he's cut some deal with this fascist Vichy regime, that, that he's soft. And this is a little bit of an obsession for Roosevelt because, of course, it, it plays in with his own complex that really the U.S. is not doing enough to really fight the Germans. I mean, after all, it was a little strange to begin with that he had declared Germany first as the priority. This back in Arcadia, December 41, after Pearl Harbor. And then on top of that, they declared the number one priority inside of Germany first was aid to Russia's offensive by all available means. And he's done everything he can to please Stalin. They've sent him just about everything that they could. Uh, at the time of Stalingrad, they're giving Stalin first priority for P-39 era Cobras. Roosevelt was even offering to send U.S. pilots to help Stalin in the airs over the North Caucasus and Stalingrad. But Stalin's position was unwavering. You know, he wants planes, but not pilots. He does not want any U.S. or British pilots to actually participate over the Soviet skies. And so Roosevelt, he just he can't make Stalin happy. No matter what he does, Stalin keeps complaining about the lack of a second front, that the U.S. and Britain are kind of you know, waging war at most in these peripheral theaters. The Russians are doing all the fighting. The Russians are doing all the fighting. And so FDR is just desperate to kind of show Stalin that he's serious. And his, his initial idea is actually to send Marshall to Moscow with this kind of almost like diplomatic surprise gift telling Stalin, well, look, we can't give you a second front yet, but instead we'll give you a consolation prize, unconditional surrender. But Stalin, he, he's not having any of it. He says, the uh, purpose of Marshall's mission not clear to me. No, 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 I have no interest. So then Roosevelt announces unconditional surrender at Casablanca, and yet again it falls flat with Stalin, who's just not impressed, who keeps needling him about the second front, the second front, the second front, over and over again becomes this just unquenchable leitmotif of Soviet bellyaching that the United States and Britain haven't opened a second front. Even when they land troops in Sicily and then the Italian mainland in July 43, he's still complaining that there's no second front. Well, of course, it never occurs to anyone to ask why Stalin is collaborating so closely with Imperial Japan in Asia. <laughs> there's no second front against Japan. Uh, but unfortunately, as the Roosevelt tries to please him, and he just can't make any headway. Yes, we come now to not only Roosevelt being sensitive to Stalin's needling, and not only Roosevelt worrying about the politics of making deals with devils. The, the concern here is a separate piece, that uh, Stalin will make peace with Germany or England will make peace with, uh, with Berlin. Everybody doubts everybody else. Moving story. And yet we come to a fact that weighs on everything at the time. February, March, April 1943. The discovery of the Katyn Mas Massacre. The Katyn Forest, layer upon layer of bones. Who are they? They are executed Polish officers. Who did it? Stalin and Molotov. That's who did it. And, Sean, we just have a moment here to spend time with this. The Poles know who did it. Sikorsky's government knows who did it. They tell the truth. And not for the first time, not for the last time. Uh, popular opinion, global opinion, all the historians, all the newspapers go along with what they know is probably falsehood. That itself is striking to me. Was Stalin surprised that Churchill and Roosevelt went along with the lie that it was the Nazis who did it and not the Soviets? 
I'm not sure if he was surprised. I mean, after all, for two years, they had really bent and buckled to every one of his demands uh, regarding Lend-Lease, regarding Allied priorities. Of course, save the Second Front, which was the great complaint. But in, in every kind of diplomatic and political sense, uh, they'd gone along with Stalin. Um, and so he, he, he bullied them quite quite firmly and unambiguously into it. He didn't just deny responsibility for the crime. He, of course, accused the Nazis of it. The Soviets would go so far at Nuremberg. They actually tried to pin the crime on the Germans, knowing perfectly well that, of course, they themselves were uh, responsible. But it, it's not just this question of responsibility for a crime. Stalin uses this uh, to break off relations with the Polish exile government in London. Uh, which ends up having serious political consequences. It's the first step in, in his ability to isolate, maneuver, and then in the end kind of destroy any possible representation for uh, the more moderate, patriotic, right-wing, um, any type of alternative to the communists um, in terms of, of Poland's political future. So he actually uses this as a lever. Um, not just to sort of force Roosevelt and Churchill into him endorsing the lie, uh, but also to to put forward his own claims on Poland, his own claims to rule Poland's political future. And in that lie, there are other lies packed inside. One revelation to me is that there were entreaties from Canaris. This is German intelligence pointing to the fact that there are people in Germany who want to get rid of Hitler and make a separate peace. Stalin knows this. In fact, he's appealed to Hitler on and off over the years for a separate peace. FDR turns away from this. Why? What, what, did, what did FDR doubt about the, second, uh, the separate peace? Well, there were certainly back-channel negotiations of all kinds, really, from, from the earliest days of the war. But you're right that although Stalin, one, one doesn't know how serious he was about the peace parlays uh, vis-a-vis Hitler, at, at, whether you're talking about 1941 or 1943. When it comes to Roosevelt, there's a clear moment in 1943 where the Germans appear to be pretty serious. There's even this attempted uh, bombing of Hitler where they nearly, uh, they nearly uh, kill him in his plane, but the, the detonator doesn't, doesn't activate. Um, and there are all kinds of back-channel approaches uh, to U.S. intelligence figures, uh, to U.S. diplomats in places like Switzerland and Spain um, and Turkey and Istanbul. Roosevelt rules this all out uh, quite right, emphatically, right, right. Um, in, in part because I think he wants to uphold this unconditional surrender idea. In fact, he, he makes, it, he makes a, a firm decision that the U.S. press must not even talk about the German resistance because that's going to kind of muddy the political water. The book is Stalin's War. Sean McMeekin, when we come back, The Second Front. I'm John Batchelor. 